getting. You can't always. This is the death. Remarkably him. Turn back. Towards God. Rise up. When we truly share story, when you and I are on fire with love, people's hearts will burn. They will find hope. To become people of hope, to be salt for the earth, that is our call. In this series, we've looked at encounter, the spirituality of encounter in the marketplace. We've reflected upon healing, that in the marketplace of our day, healing is desperately needed. But with healing now comes hope. So you and I are called by the gospel to be prophets of hope within our world. And in this small reflection, I want to break open a story we've heard many times, a story about two of the followers of Jesus, and they are escaping. They are running away after the death of Jesus, and they are downcast. But the story finishes in hope, in a sense of mission. Hope is at the heart of the marketplace. To become people of hope, a light on the hilltop, to be salt for the earth. That is our call. There is so much pain. The relationship that is broken down. There's confusion. There's a loss of a sense of self. Too often we hear of young people and others taking their own actual lives. There's mental illness. People are down. Violence in its many forms. And in the midst of this, we're needing a spirituality of hope. The journey from Tabor to the plains surrounding it. The Holy Thursday journey to the garden, to Good Friday, to the cross, but that journey ends with Easter morn. We are people of hope, people who believe deeply that love will always conquer fear, will always conquer hate, that the dark of the storm will see the sunrise and the rainbow. Our pain, our loss has meaning. It's a stepladder to an ever deeper love, a deeper sense of commitment and purpose and meaning. And the absolute paradox of the cross, captured in the peace prayer attributed to Saint Francis, it is in giving that we receive, in pardoning that we are pardoned, in dying that we're born into eternal life. Too often, the marketplace is, is we see this short-term uh, pleasure-driven approaches. Too often in the marketplace we see confusion and people lost and they are competing their calls upon our, us for our time and our energy. And in the midst of the marketplace we can get lost and tired in the rush of living. Too often the marketplace lacks a personal discipline and the ability or the desire to sacrifice self for the other, to sacrifice the short-term feeling of satisfaction for the greater, the deeper and the longer, longer good. 
in all of this, the gospel of Jesus has so much to offer. In dying to self, the seed gives a rich harvest. The whole essence of the gospel is that of the servant, the washing of the feet, getting up from table and wrapping towel. Those who would seek to be first will be last and the last first. Take the lowest seat. The gospel gives us a road map for the journey, one of self-denial, one of washing of the feet, one of service of the other, one of going within, going deeper, and all of which paradoxically leads to life in all its fullness. So I want to break open an Easter story, a story of hope. For the characters in this story, as I said just before, begin downcast. And the story ends with passion and enthusiasm, setting out on mission in the middle of the night. The Emmaus story. They are escaping from Jerusalem. They are exhausted, tired. And it's when they are downcast that Jesus comes up when they are afraid, when they were tired, when they'd lost hope. At that very moment, when they are most alone, he is there by their side. Isn't that powerful? He walks by their side, not in front of them, not behind them. He does not rush by a ship in the, in the a night. He does not say, excuse me, and sneak past. An absolute stranger. And he does the most crazy of things. He comes up to perfect strangers and walks by their side. But something prevents them from wreck recognising him. And how often in your story and mine are we, are we blinkered and we do not see? Do we come as guests to the people within our own lives? Do we engage the other the way Jesus does? He engages them. He invites relationship. He gives them power. What are you talking about as you walk along? He comes to their pain as guest. He invites them to share their story. He empowers. And then what does he do? He walks with them for seven miles, for 11.263 kilometres. Not just a stroll down by, by the lake, not just a stroll down to the, to the shop. It's a long journey. That's seven miles. The longest, hardest journey. The only journey which matters. And he walks by their side for every metre of it. His brotherhood is no flash in the pan, nor is God's sisterhood on our journey. He walks beside us. And what does he do? What does he do? He shares his story, the Jesus story with them. And they then say later, did not our hearts burn within us as he spoke to us on that road. When we truly share story, when we come as guests, when you and I are on fire with love, people's hearts will burn. They will find hope. They arrive at the end. 
Very often we think we've arrived on the journeys that we walk and we often live for those particular arrival times. We want answers. We want the end. We want the comfort of the end. The comfort of the easy answers. But life is a journey. There are no arrivals really. So they go in to their place. They go in looking for a sense of of security. They go in to rest on the journey. And he, Jesus, um, the pilgrim, he makes as if to go on. And a powerful moment, they invite him in. The scripture says they press him to stay with them. They urge him, invite him, beg him, come into table with us. The complete stranger invited into table with them. Has something shifted? Are they the same people that he first met on the road? What's happened to their eyes? Has their eyes and their hearts shifted? Are they much more open now? They risk hospitality to a stranger. Why? Perhaps the stranger has come as guests. Perhaps he has hosted them. Perhaps he's invited them to share their story and they felt safe sharing it. Perhaps he was deeply present. Perhaps his presence said, you are lovable. You are beautiful. You have no need to fear. Be love for our world. And know that I, love, walk beside you. So what does this Jesus, what does this stranger do? He accepts their invitation. Perhaps all God is longing for, perhaps all God wants of you and I is our invitation to come in. He will do the rest. He doesn't ask for perfection. He doesn't ask for strength. He doesn't ask for the answers. Just the invitation to allow him in and to walk beside us. Then what does he do? He breaks bread. He does the most simple of things. He did what any host would do. At table, he broke open the bread of life. And what you do when you break open bread? You then share it. And what happens when he shares? What happened after they journeyed for that seven miles? What happened after they had shared story, had gone over rough ground, the good times and the bad, up hills and down the valleys, through the hostile lands? What had happened after they had journeyed with one another when they'd shared story? After all of that, in the breaking of bread, Their eyes are open. This is a story of fidelity. Their eyes were opened. Their eyes were opened and they recognised him. They could see him. They saw the presence of God. They saw the presence of love in their lives, on their journey, in their midst right under their noses. Not only that, they recognised that presence within them, for did not our hearts burn within us? Now, despite all of this, they had not recognised him on the actual road, had not recognised him as he listened to their story, had not recognised him when he explained the actual scriptures to us, they recognised him after they had invited him in. After he'd sat down at table with them, after he had broken bread and shared bread. 
And so now, after all of this, what do they do? He's now kind of almost vanished. Do they break open another bottle of wine at the Emmaus shop? Do they go back to their rooms and light a candle and say, wow, wasn't that an extraordinary experience? Do they take a photo of the table and say, the place where we met the risen Lord? No. Do they form a prayer group there and sing hymns? Do they begin a cult of of actual pilgrims to the Emmaus Inn? They do none of those things. No. They set out that instant and return to Jerusalem. Remember that it is now you know, nighttime. It is dark. It's 11.263 kilometres of, there's, there, there aren't any street lamps. It's a rough kind of part of the world. It is a scary time. In the middle of the night, they set out. And the poor old donkey that's just got into its manger and just chewing away on a bit of maize, they come and get it and they say sorry. And they set out in the middle of the night on mission with good news. He is risen indeed. He lives. He is love. So they set out with hope a hope they did not have. So in our marketplace, in our spirituality of the heart, the Emmaus story is like a map for us. In the marketplaces of our day, he will walk beside us. Especially when we are down, he will be there. And so often in the marketplace, we will not recognise him, nor the presence of love. But that is okay. He will walk beside us regardless. He, Jesus, love, longs for our invitation. He, Jesus, love, will be there with us for the long haul, for the good times and the bad. He will come as guest into our lives. He will be deeply present to us and within us. He will become an intimate part of our story. He will come to table with us. And in the small things and the small times and in the big, In the breaking of bread, we will recognise him. And that bread will be food for our journey. But he will depart from our sight, empowered and then nourished. We will be invited to go forth in mission. Sometimes in the dark times, in the middle of the night, then temptation will always be to stay at the inn, to stay comfortable and to stay safe. But mission is not lived in the safe and the comfortable times. We will find life out on the highways and the byways of the marketplace. And when we get lost, which we will. Remember the beautiful words of Augustine. Saint Augustine said, he departed from our sight that we might return to our hearts and find him there. So in those lonely times, in those lost and dark times, return to your heart over and over and over again and you will find him there, ever faithful, ever, ever uh, loving, ever smiling at you and the fidelity of your journey.
lot of talk in our church today about the new evangelization. And we might ask, well, what's new about the new evangelization? One thing that's new is that we're trying to renew the faith in people who should already be Catholic, should already be Christian. Individuals, families, communities, whole cultures that need to rediscover the gospel. And so what's new is that they're getting a new shot in the arm of faith, of evangelization. Another thing that's new about it is the way that we do that. And the new media and groups like Shalom World TV are very important for bringing the gospel anew to our cultures, to our families, to each of us individually. And so I encourage all the viewers of Shalom World TV and I encourage uh, Shalom World TV themselves to keep up the good work, uh, to keep watching this channel and to keep up the good work of presenting the Catholic faith to our world today.